As a one-man show, there's plenty of tools I depend on, and I'm gonna go over all of them from the essentials to the more premium and even some luxurious ones. And we're gonna tally it all up and see how much I spend each month to keep this channel running. And let's start with the must-have tools. These are the ones that I depend on the most, and the first is my editing app of choice, which is Final Cut Pro. And this is something that I took a while to decide because DaVinci Resolve and Premiere Pro are getting a ton of new features. And they're also a lot more popular with other editors, which is kind of a big deal if one day you want to work with others. Final Cut is also a lot more limited in terms of color correction and audio. But what keeps me coming back to it is the speed. It's really smooth to cut up a timeline, which is crucial since that's what I spend most of my time doing. And it's also really well optimized for Apple devices. Even my M3 Air can edit 4K footage without proxies. Plus it rarely crashes and I just enjoy editing with it, which has to count for something. Don't get me wrong, DaVinci is great. It's definitely the best option when it comes to color grading and has everything you could want in one place. But I just don't need that level of complexity and I find that Final Cut is just easier to use. And on the other hand, Premiere is the industry standard and is on the cutting edge of new features, but I don't think it's anywhere near as stable. It's also worth mentioning that these platforms have very different pricing structures. Final Cut is a one-time purchase of $300 and it only works on Mac. DaVinci has a fully capable free version or a one-time purchase of $300 to access all the features. And Premiere is just outrageously priced at $23 a month. If I was just starting out and using a Mac, I'd go with Final Cut. Otherwise, DaVinci Resolve. I also try to avoid using Adobe products in general because, as a company, I think Adobe ranks among the scummiest I've seen. Having said that, there's one Adobe product for which there's really no competition, and that's Adobe Photoshop, which I use for my thumbnails. Luckily, there is a Photoshop photography plan at $10 a month. The only difference is that you're not going to have a ton of space on their cloud storage, which I was never going to use anyway. When I was first starting out, I tried Affinity Photo, which is the only real competitor. And for the price, Affinity is top notch. It's just that Photoshop is a lot more feature rich and there's a much bigger community around it, so finding answers to your problems is a lot easier. Okay, so we've talked about editing and thumbnails, but as for planning my videos, I use Notion. Longtime viewers know I use Obsidian for almost everything, but to write my videos, Notion just makes more sense as I make heavy use of databases. I'm not gonna go too in depth on Notion versus Obsidian as I made a full video about it that you can find right here as well as in the description below. Okay, so aside from making videos, I also write about my experiences once a month and share them via email to my newsletter subscribers. And for that, I use Substack. I chose this because I can have as many email subscribers as I want for free, and it has a very decent interface. But there's other options here. The most popular ones right now are probably ConvertKit and Beehive. And I was tempted to move to ConvertKit recently when they offer the free plan up to 10,000 subscribers. But I'm not sure that's worth it because ConvertKit and Beehive are really meant for people that sell stuff to their audience. I don't sell anything, so I don't really wanna waste my time learning a new platform. Plus, if I do get to 10,000 email subscribers, I will then have to pay a whopping $100 a month to stay on ConvertKit, so it really makes no sense for someone like me. So let's now go over a few nice-to-have services. These are the ones that I don't necessarily need, but they do add a ton of value for a relatively small price. One of those is having a custom domain in my email. I'm not gonna bullshit you and say you need this, you don't, but it does look good in my opinion and it's pretty affordable. And to do this, you just need a domain name, something like yournameorbusiness.com and an email service provider. And I think everyone who has any sort of online presence should at least register a domain name. Because even if you don't plan on having a website in the near future, you might change your mind later and that domain might be taken. And domains are pretty affordable at around $10 a year. I think that's a small price to pay for the peace of mind that it will be there when you need it. Plus, you get to use that domain for your email address so that your email looks something like this as opposed to this. And as for where to get a domain, Cloudflare is always my first choice. It's reliable, no hidden fees, no complaints. But that also means you need to have an email provider with a plan that lets you use a custom email address. And my choice here is Proton Mail, which has been my main email provider for six years now across all my businesses. Proton is a privacy first email that also offers a full suite of apps like Proton Drive, Proton Calendar, etc. It's basically a more privacy oriented version of Gmail. It's really nice, but because it takes security so seriously, it doesn't easily integrate with other platforms other than Apple Mail and Outlook. 
So if you want to use something like Spark or Superhuman, if you're mad enough to pay $30 a month for it, then you can't use ProtonMail. For me, that's not really an issue as they have native apps across all devices and they work pretty well, so no complaints there. They also offer stuff like a VPN and a password manager, so it could potentially replace all of those for you. And because of that, you'd think hosting your email with Proton would be much more expensive than Google, but it's actually not the case. If you want to use Google as your email service provider with a custom domain, you have to get a Google Workspace plan that starts at $6 a month and is billed yearly. This is a lot more for what Proton charges for a similar tier. And one thing that everyone always forgets is that if you already pay for iCloud, even if you just pay for the cheapest plan, you can use it as your email provider with a custom domain, which is insane value at just a dollar a month. Okay, so probably the most annoying part of editing is cutting out the mistakes and silent parts. But there's one app that makes this process so much easier, which is ReCut. So when I'm done filming a video and transferring the footage to my Mac, the first thing I do is add that footage to ReCut and then, with just a click of a button, ReCut removes all the silent parts and separates each piece of dialogue. And I can then export it as a timeline into any editing app that I want and start working on it. Getting rid of the silent parts is useful, but what really makes a difference is separating every line I say into its own clip. I make a ton of mistakes when I record and this lets me easily hop around between those takes and decide which ones to keep. And on top of that, you can customize exactly how much space you want between takes, so you don't have to adjust each one individually. This is a one-time payment of $100, but if you edit your videos, you know how much time this will save you. And just like me, you also probably work with video assets like B-roll, background music, brand logos, etc. And for the longest time, I had everything organized in a folder structure. So I would have a B-roll folder with a bunch of subfolders, and it was a huge pain to go and find the exact asset I needed. But with this app called Eagle, that's no longer the case. Eagle is essentially a user interface for your assets that lets you easily see and categorize them in a ton of different ways. So let's say I want to find the B-roll clip to use. I can come here to filter and because I tag everything, I can then filter by tags, choose B-roll, then I know it was shot upstairs and that my dog Maki was in it. And just like that, I found the one I was looking for. I can also filter by a bunch of different things and I can even hover over each one and play it. It works so well that I don't even bother naming my clips anymore. Instead, I tag them just like I would tag a note. I also use it to collect inspiration for different things, which is super easy to do with Eagle's Chrome extension. So if I see a thumbnail I like when I'm browsing YouTube, I can just drag it around a little and I'll get a pop-up window from Eagle that lets me save it straight to my thumbnail inspiration folder. Honestly, this is a great tool at an affordable price of $30. There's also a complete revamp coming up with Eagle 4.0, which will probably already be out by the time you're watching this video, and I can't wait to see what they come up with. And then there's Epidemic Sound, which is the place where I get the background music you see in all my videos. I placed this as a nice to have since there are free alternatives like YouTube's library of copyright free music but I really like the music on Epidemic Sound and I've never gotten a copyright claim. There's also a few cool features like recommendations specifically for my YouTube channel, as well as playlists curated by other creators. They're also constantly bringing new music and sound effects to their library, so I'm happy to pay $10 a month to use it. Another must-have tool if you're looking to automate your workflows is the sponsor of today's video, Make. Make is the leading no-code automation platform that allows anyone to automate anything from tasks and workflows to apps and systems. This is all done seamlessly without needing to know how to code, which is why it's no surprise that Make powers over half a million businesses worldwide. These automations can be as complex as you want them to be, and they can actually solve real problems. For instance, Notion is great at what it does, but it cannot compete with quick capture tools like Todoist that let you easily capture anything, even by just using your Apple Watch. But with Make, it doesn't have to compete because you can still use Todoist to capture and then simply have Make automatically move that task to Notion. And if you don't want every task to be imported, you can tell Make exactly which ones it should look for. For me, I have it so that it only imports the ones with the Notion label. And the best part is that we don't even have to create this ourselves because we can find this and many other workflows already pre-built for us to use. 
I can just add it to my scenarios, follow the instructions, and now any task I add to Todoist will also be sent to my Notion database. And this is just one of the endless automations you can create with Make, which will help you save a ton of time in the long run. And if you sign up with my link below, you'll get one month free of their pro plan, which includes 10,000 operations per month. And a big thank you to Make for sponsoring today's video. All right, so you know when you're watching a video that features different products, and then you go to the description and you see a bunch of links that look like this? This is Genius Link, which is essentially a really fancy link shortener. But creators don't use it just to shorten the links. Because if you're watching my videos from the UK or Spain or France and you click on those links, it doesn't take you to Amazon.com. It'll take you to Amazon UK or Amazon France. And this is good for the viewer as presumably if you live in France, you're not going to shop in Amazon US. And it's also good for the creators because we receive a small commission from each purchase made through our links. And this is what Genius Link solves because I can just add an Amazon product to Genius and it'll give me a link that directs the viewer to the right Amazon store. I put this as a nice to have because you can do this for free with Amazon's own service called Amazon One Link. But there's a few big differences in quality of life features that Genius Link provides, and I left a link to an article that highlights all of those in the description box below. Their pricing is also really affordable for these types of services, and you only pay for the clicks you use. It starts at $6 for 2,000 clicks, and it gets progressively cheaper the more clicks you have. For comparison, URL Genius, which I think is the closest competitor, charges $40 a month for 2,000 clicks. If I look at my billing dashboard for this year, I averaged around $17 a month, which is an average of 7,000 clicks. If I was using URL Genius, it would cost 7 to 8 times more, so yeah, very happy with it. So as a content creator on YouTube, thumbnails and titles are super important. I wish it wasn't the case, but it is. And the only way to accurately measure if a certain thumbnail or title is better than the other is to test it. Now, of course, you can A-B test it manually by switching the thumbnail on your video and trying to keep track of what happens, but it's much better to use a specialized tool. And YouTube has recently released a tool that does this, but it's nowhere near as good as this third-party tool called Thumbnail Test. For starters, YouTube's feature only allows you to test thumbnails, not titles or combinations of both. It also only lets you test three thumbnails at a time and gives you almost no information about the end result. All you get is watch time. And if we look at a few of my past tests on thumbnailtest.com, you see that I get all the information I could possibly want. The YouTube one is still good and it's great for beginners, especially since it's free, which is why I'm classifying this as a luxury and not nice to have. But this gives you so much more control. It's not even close and for me, it just pays for itself. And the other one is called One of Ten and is probably my most expensive subscription at a whopping $350 a year. And what it does is that it shows you outliers across YouTube. So let's say there's a channel that has an average of 1,000 views per video. And then one day, a video gets 100,000 views. That video is an outlier because it performed considerably better than others in that channel. And the reason this is helpful is because something about that video clicked with a wider audience. And even if it's in a niche completely irrelevant to mine, there's still a lot to learn from it and it could even generate ideas from my own videos. Because with this tool, I can take that outlier and find similar topics or similar thumbnails and get a ton of inspiration and ideas for what videos I might like to make. Another cool feature is that you can get really specific with how you filter these results to get exactly what you're looking for. It also comes with a Chrome extension so you can see the outliers directly on YouTube. So if we go to my channel and sort by descending, you can see that these here were my outliers and the number represents how much of an outlier it was. So a 10x outlier means that this video got 10 times more views than what my videos usually get. Recently, the team over at MrBeast came up with a similar service called ViewStats Pro. It's not exactly the same as one of 10, but their features overlap quite a bit. But to be honest, I didn't find it to be any better, just more expensive at $480 a year. But then again, it is a MrBeast product, so I wouldn't be surprised if it completely overtakes one of 10 in a year or so. But for now, and from what I've seen, I still think this is the best option. 
All right, so I still wanna go into services that I plan on getting in the future, as well as a few that I've tried and gotten no value out of. But before that, I do have some honorable mentions. The first is Storyblocks, which has a huge library of stock footage that you can use as B-roll in your videos. I have used them in the past when I was first starting out and I never had any issue with copyright claims. But I'm no longer a subscriber because I prefer to film my own B-roll. It takes more time but it looks more personal and allows me to build up my own library of B-roll footage that I can then use forever. Storyblocks is also quite expensive at $30 a month but it also includes a music and sound effects library. It's not as extensive as Epidemic Sound, but it gets the job done. So if you use Storyblocks, you can probably get away with not paying for something like Epidemic Sound. And the other honorable mention is Motion VFX, which has a ton of plugins that you can use on most editing platforms like Final Cut or Premiere. If I go on my Motion VFX dashboard, you can see that I've grabbed plenty of their plugins and they save me a ton of time. Unless you're good with After Effects or Apple Motion, you're gonna get a ton of value from using these. There are other places to find plugins like Envato or FX Factory, and they do tend to be cheaper, but I found that the ones from Motion VFX are a lot more polished. I want to also mention a few tools that I don't think are worth the cost, which are vidIQ and TubeBuddy. I think it's important to mention this because it's really common for new people on YouTube to jump on those two because they're so heavily promoted across the platform. And I was one of them as well, and honestly, they were useful in the past back when tags and keywords mattered, but those things don't really matter anymore. They also had some other features for which there were no real alternatives. For instance, not too long ago, before thumbnailtest.com and YouTube's version of it, a lot of people, myself included, used the highest tier plan of TubeBuddy just to use their A-B test feature. It's not that these companies are a scam or anything, but I feel like creators that are just getting started feel like they need them to succeed, when they really don't. And I think both vidIQ and TubeBuddy also realize this because they now offer their higher tier plans at a significant discount when paying the year upfront. I also want to mention a service that I will be paying for soon, which is Framer. For a long time, I used to have a very simple website running on DigitalOcean using Ghost. In fact, that was my very first video on this channel years ago, and honestly, it's kind of painful to look at it now as I was just starting out then, so the production left a lot to be desired, let's just leave at that. Anyway, my website was using Ghost, and if you're not familiar with Ghost, it's a very common open source blog and newsletter platform, and I was happy with it. But since then, so many other tools have come out, specifically tools that let you build a website without using any code. One of which is Framer, and that's what I'm planning to use for my next website. There's also a lot more alternatives, and they all have their strengths and weaknesses. Card is a great option if all you need is a one-page website that sort of redirects your traffic to other sources. It's also one of the cheapest options on the market and I think it has tremendous value. But if you want something more complex that is also no code, that's when you should look at something like Framer or Webflow. This is not my area of expertise, but a lot of people recommended Framer to me, so I'm gonna give it a try. Okay, so if we tally all of them up and we convert the yearly subscriptions into monthly ones, it comes down to $110 each month. And for the ones that are just a one-time payment, like Final Cut and different plugins, it comes down to $730. And while this might seem like a lot, bigger creators that have teams pay more than this in just two Adobe Creative Cloud subscriptions. And on the other end of the spectrum, there are also huge creators out there that don't pay a single subscription, barely edit their videos, make a thumbnail in a few seconds using their phone, and they have millions of subscribers. So it really is all about perspective. And if you're a creator and you use different tools, I'd love to know which ones you're using, so let me know in the comments. That's gonna be it for this video though. Thank you guys so much for watching till the end, and I'll see you in the next one.